Hi folks, this is Gordon Parker from Michigan Tech and in this video we're going to look at gears. After going through some of the kinematics and dynamics, we'll go into an example where we have a gearbox that drives a winch and the winch has to uh, raise a load. I'll lay down some requirements for how the load should move and then we'll go all the way back and figure out what the motor torque needs to be to make that motion happen. Well, let's start with this very basic gear train. We have a little gear, the red one, driving this larger gear, the brown one. And I've defined two angles, theta 1 and theta 2. Now I've picked these so that they're consistent. So when the gears are engaged, this is the sort of motion that you would get. If theta 1 is going clockwise, then theta 2 would be going counterclockwise. What we'll do with this is look at the kinematics, define the gear ratio, and then look at how the gear ratio affects the torque transmitted from the little gear to the big gear. Well, let's start with the kinematics. And if you look at the arc traversed by each of these gears, and of course they're meshing, so that arc length has to be the same for both gears, then you'd have r theta 1, the arc length for the little gear, equals r2 theta 2. And you can differentiate this until the cows come home, so you get relationships between uh, speed and also acceleration. And that gives us the definition of the gear ratio. Specifically, it's equal to R2 over R1, or the big gear radius divided by the little gear radius. So if the little gear is rotating like stink, that is really fast, then the big gear is going to be rotating much slower, well, n times slower. Now let's look at how the gear ratio affects the torque that gets transmitted from the little gear to the big gear. And we'll do this by just solving a statics problem. Now you've probably already figured out my notation that the little gear is gear one and the big gear is gear two. Just a minute ago when we were looking at kinematics, I defined positive theta one as clockwise and positive theta two as counterclockwise. Now for the statics analysis, I'm gonna do something different and you can see it in the coordinate frame. Here, the positive theta is just out of the page, and we'll use that for both gears. So let's take these free body diagrams and apply some forces. Now, I'm ignoring the reaction forces in green. That would be the, you know, the forces at the mounts of the gears. They don't contribute anything to the moments applied to the two gears. The force that does, though, is that interaction force, or that gear tooth force that I've denoted as F. Doing a moment balance on gear one, we get negative tau one, because that's in the negative sense, according to my positive direction in that coordinate frame, uh, plus r cross f, which in this case would be r one times f, and that's equal to zero. We get a similar thing for gear two. And now what I'll do is just resolve out the f, or solve for the f in the uh, gear one equation. So that's tau one over r one, and stuff it into the gear two equation. And then solve for tau two. And we can see that that's just equal to n times tau one. So in summary, if we look at life from a gear two perspective, then the speed is reduced compared to what is happening with gear one and the torque is amplified. Well, now let's go on and look at the dynamics of this little gear train. And notice that I've gone back to the notation where theta 1 positive is clockwise and theta 2 positive is counterclockwise. I'm applying a tau 1 to gear 1, and we can think of gear 2 then as being the output of that gear train. Let's get some properties down for this. We have radiuses, masses, and mass moments of inertia about the rotation axis, which is out of the page. So I'm just denoting those things as R, M, and J, respectively. Here's our gear ratio information that we had on the previous page. Now let's get some free body diagrams going. Just break out the two gears and start lathering them up with all the external moments. Now the first moments that I like to put on these types of rotational problems are the inertia moments. And they're just in the opposite direction of what I've defined as being positive theta 2 and positive theta 1. So here I have a J2 theta 2 double dot in the opposite direction of positive theta 2. And similarly, a J1 theta 1 double dot in the opposite direction of positive theta 1. Now let's do that 
gear tooth force equal and opposite and now just sum up the moments so for gear one we just have the negative j1 theta1 double dot a minus fr1 and a plus tau1 and then we do the same thing for gear two and just like we did with the statics problem we're going to resolve away that force so i'm going to take gear one solve for that tooth force and then stuff it into the gear 2 equation. And we get this. Now, we can also use our kinematics and get rid of that theta 1 double dot. Now, I could get rid of the theta 2 double dot, but it seems like it would be nice to have the dynamic equation where tau 1 is the input and theta 2 motion is the output, since that's the output of our gear train. So there's our kinematics stuff that in and we get this for our dynamic equation. Now it has that beautiful form of a j theta 2 double dot equals n tau 1 where the j is what we now call the effective inertia and that's just equal to the j1 n squared plus j2. Here's the example. We're going to have a winch that's driven by the gear train that we just analyzed and what we'll need to do is determine the motor torque needed to achieve a certain acceleration profile of the load. And here's the acceleration profile. It's just a pulse, coast, pulse. This is a really common and nice acceleration profile if you can make it happen. The reason is that if you integrate this and look at the speed, you get this beautiful little trapezoid. And if you integrate that again for position, you get a very smooth S-shaped profile. Well, let's have a look at the system. Here's our gear train again, nothing new there. But now what we're going to do is affix or fasten that green drum to the output gear, the brown gear, gear two, and then have a mass hanging off the end of that drum. Now because we have another mass in this problem, technically we could have another free body diagram, but certainly we should at least specify a positive direction of motion for that mass. And I'm just going to make that consistent with the theta 2. So if theta 2 is positive, then x is positive. Here's some information about the system. We have the same radii and inertias that we had for the gear train on the previous page, but now we also have to think about the drum. It has its own radius and its own inertia. And as I mentioned before, it's stuck to or fastened to the output gear, gear two. We could solve this by writing three free body diagrams and analyzing them just like we did for the gear train, but now we have this mass hanging off the end. Or we could use what we already did for the gear train and just say that we have an effective inertia associated with the gear train times theta two double dot equals n tau one. And we have to modify our J effective just a little bit because that green drum is attached to the brown gear. And so we just have to add capital J, that is the inertia of the drum, to the J2 or the inertia of the brown gear 2. And so now our free body diagrams look like this. We have theta 2 in the direction shown, so counterclockwise, and X is positive up. And we can work out some kinematics between theta 2 and x, similar to how we did for the two gears. R theta 2 is equal to x. You can flip that around, and you can differentiate that as many times as you'd like. So let's start putting some forces on this. We have gravity acting on the, um, on the load, and we also have the inertial force in the opposite direction of what I've defined as being positive x. And of course, we have a little tension and the equal and opposite tension on the drum and the inertia mo inertial moment on the drum. And finally, the torque transmitted from the little gear to the big gear. Here I'm summing the moments for the drum and here's the sum of the forces for the load. Now we can combine those two by resolving out the tension. If I solve for tension in the second equation and stuff it into that first equation, I get a single equation.
I've also done one other thing. I've replaced the theta 2 double dot with our kinematics of 1 over capital R times x double dot. Now let's take this equation and just multiply through by r to get rid of that nasty r in the denominator. And we get this. It's a beautiful looking thing. Now we're just going to solve for tau 1. We know what x double dot is. It's the pulse coast pulse profile. So we can stick that in for x double dot and we'll know exactly what tau 1 needs to be. Now if tau 1 is generated by a motor, that gives us some insight into how we have to spec out that motor. Now let me torture you with some numbers. That'll give us a feel for how the different terms in that tau equation that we had on the previous page interact with each other. So first off, let's say that we want the load to have a max acceleration of 0.3 meters per second squared. That's our capital A. And on whatever crazy planet this is, the gravitational acceleration is 10 meters per second squared. That just makes the calculations a little easier. And our load is just a kilogram, you know, a little bit over two pounds. The gears will use um, one centimeter for the small gear and five centimeter radius for the big gear. So you can imagine this takes up a fair amount of real estate. Here's some inertias for gear one and gear two. And here is the radius of the drum or the winch and its inertia. So clearly we have a gear ratio n equals 5, just r2 divided by r1. And let's not forget the equation for tau1 from the previous page. Now let's calculate some of the quantities. So here's the effective inertia. Let's look at those terms. The j1 n squared plus j2 is 600 times 10 to the negative 6, and the capital J is 1600 times 10 to the negative 6. So we can't really throw either of those two terms out. They're both relevant. Sometimes you can neglect a term here or there, but in this case we can't. And now let's start plugging all these things into the tau 1 equation. Here I've just moved the effective inertia up into the tau 1 equation and also stuck in the mr squared, which is 0.01. Again, those two terms are sort of similar in size, so I can't neglect either of them. And that gets multiplied by x double dot, and then you add 0.1 to it and divide the whole thing by 0.5. Now what's interesting here is that if x double dot is relatively small, which it is in our case 0.3 meters per second squared, then that term is really quite tiny compared to the 0.1. Put another way, it means that the gravitational term is really going to dominate our tau 1 calculation. And so we should expect to see a significant tau 1 associated with gravity, and then just a wee little bit plus or minus on that due to the pulse action. Let's have a look at the two extremes. So when x double dot is 0.3 meters per second squared, the tau 1 is 0.2073 newton meters, or about 30 ounce inches. And when x double dot is negative 0.3, it's pretty close to what it was before. It's just slightly smaller, 0.1927, or about 27 ounce inches. So again, gravity is kind of dominating this problem. Not a huge surprise. Now we're going to have some fun with it in Simscape. And to do that, I have to get a little bit more specific about the uh, pulse coast pulse profile. So let's have each of the pulses last for one second and the coast is 0.5 seconds. Let's see what we have here. I have a little setup script that just defines all the parameters that we were looking at a moment ago. And I have an old model and a newer model, so let's look at the newer model. Now my intent isn't to go into all the details of this model, so we'll just look at it from a high level. Here's the input, you know, the, the x double dot, or actually it's the motor command. It's a pulse coast pulse. 
this world frame is, you can think of it as the ground. It's what you attach everything to. So here's our command going into the gear set, which is here. So this motor command is going into uh, spinning this gear. And then here's the winch and the load. Now when I run this, it's going to pop up a visualization interface and then just run the model. So things will happen pretty quick and then I'll um, restart it so we can look at it more carefully. So it took off. Let me reset it. Here is the drum. Here's the gears. And when this thing is animating and simulating, we can actually see, see the gears moving. The gears are behind this drum, and I made the drum slightly transparent so you could see that. We can flip this around, look at it in different ways. Here's a little perspective view so you can see the three-dimensional aspect to the model. And let's play it. Look at that. Beautiful motion. Very smooth. That's what you get with those pulse coast pulse acceleration profiles. Just a beautiful position response. Let's have a look at it again. Ugh. Never get tired of that. Okay, so now let's take a look at the data. As the model was running, I was logging data, and so we'll go into this data inspector. And we could look at a lot of things, but remember the goal of this problem was to specify the torque requirements for gear one based on achieving a certain um, acceleration requirement for the load. So here is the torque for gear one. And if I put some cursors on this, here is the maximum torque. Now the signs are um, flipped just because of the orientation of the gear, but the 0.2073 is exactly what we calculated uh, by hand. And when we go up here for that you know, minimum torque, 0.1927. Again, exactly what we calculated by hand. Now let's have a look at the gear speed. That's also usually an important thing for motors. So down here we have the max speed Oops, is 143.2 RPM. Now what this design tells me is that a gear ratio of 5 is probably too small. Your typical motor can spin up to you know 3,000 RPM or more. So we're just using a tiny bit of the speed capability of this motor and we would be trying to size the motor with a gear ratio of 5 to achieve this sort of a torque which is 0.2 newton meters or you know the 30 ounce inches or so which is a decent amount. If I went with a larger gear ratio I could reduce the size of the motor. I could use a, a lower um, uh, torque of the motor, but in contrast, I would get a higher speed. But I have a long way to go in terms of using the speed capability of your typical motor. So just from looking at this, I would say, you know, I could probably go with a gear ratio of, you know, 20 or so easily or more and have a very tiny motor and get the job done. So to summarize, we started off looking at gear ratio and how it affects speed and torque. And that took us into the dynamics of a very basic gear train. Armed with that notion of effective inertia, then we looked at an example where we just applied that directly to solve something a little bit more complicated than your basic gear train. And then we compared our hand calculations to a simulation. And the simulation is just sort of fun because you can visualize what's happening. So I hope this helps. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.